humans in general, we, we like to create scripts and stories that we live by. I'm this way because of this incident. I'm this way because this happened to me. I mean, because my dad was me. That doesn't mean we need to stay that way. That doesn't mean it's okay. Is there evidence to back up that we cannot teach kids to process the game faster? Is it, can we really not teach confidence? Is that true? So you're gonna take a kid that jumps hundreds, if not thousands of times a week, and you're gonna bring them into your gym and you're gonna have them box jump because that's what that kid thinks he needs to do. He doesn't, he's a kid. It's not his fault. That's what I thought. Cross over at this cone, do a behind the back at this cone, do a spin move at this cone, and then jump from this spot. Perfect. No, that's not basketball. All right, Bobby, we're live. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing fantastic. I'm up in uh, Okemo, Vermont, sitting in my truck, looking at a pretty nice mountain with some snow on it, taking a little break, and uh, looking forward to this conversation. How, uh, how's the snow today? Uh, it's northeast. Uh, uh, we're in America, so it's northeast, and they haven't gotten too much snow, but it's, uh, it's enough to get going and have a good time. All right, that's good to hear, man. For for people who don't know you yet, could you talk a little bit about you and your story, what you do? Uh, talk a little bit about my story is tough. I, I've, got, I've got a pretty wild story, so. Um, so give us the give us the short version, and then we'll uh, dig into the longer version after. The the short version. I was a um, underachieving, highly emotional, big person my entire life in terms of size. I, I was always. I'm six foot seven, about 235 pounds now. And I, I was always big in stature, but my the, the emotional and the mental sides, I was always slow to adjust and I was always slow to build relationships. And I was always very worried about what other people thought about me and shy. I, I have a big family, I have six sisters. Um, my dad has been my best friend since I, you know, since I can remember, I grew up hunting, fishing, uh, playing sports and uh, that, you know, sports and hunting and fishing for me all kind of lumped in the same thing. It was a way to spend time with my best friend, who was my dad, who ended up being my best friend and uh, my my uh, my best man in my wedding. And um, I was always active, and I was never a specialist in terms of uh, playing one sport. I ended up getting into basketball, playing professionally. Now I train mostly basketball players, but growing up, I was on the swim team. I played tennis. I did karate. I played. Uh, football, basketball, baseball. Um, I had hockey skates. Not that I ever played hockey, but like, like I was just doing everything. So I never was really good at any of them. I was, you know, I would make the travel team, but I wasn't, I was never a superstar. I was never good. So now that I got to high school, I grew, I had a huge growth spurt. I went from like six foot to six, six from my freshman to sophomore year. And again, I was late to develop both em uh, emotionally and I was like to develop physically. A lot of the kids were shaving or had hair on their legs at ninth grade. And I, you know, I went to college and I wasn't shaving yet. So I, I was a baby. And um, by the time I specialized in basketball, I, I, I never built a confidence in that one area to be a great high school basketball player. So I, I dreamed of playing division one and I, I ended up playing division three basketball at a school up in upstate New York. And um, that's where my life kind of took a turn and it's it a bad turn, a, a wrong turn. And like I said, growing up, I was always kind of worried about what table I sat at in the lunchroom or, you know, what other people thought about me. And I was never overly concerned about what I thought about myself because I didn't think highly of myself. I wasn't confident. I didn't believe in myself. My mom told me I could play professional basketball and I didn't believe her. My dad told me I should shoot more on the basketball court and I didn't believe him. Right. And I was always I was a people pleaser. I wanted to make my coaches happy. And I knew hard work. My dad was captain of a crew team. So he's a rower. Right. And I mean, that's a sport that is it, it's more grueling than any other sport. You row as hard as you can and then you row harder. You know, and he was the catcher on his baseball team. He was a football player, blue collar guy. And, and I knew how to work hard, but working harder never equated to actually performing well for me. Like I, I if I was alone with my dad in the park. I was great. I could hit three pointers and I could do all these different things. But the second that there was a light on me, the second that there was a performance component in competing, I, w I was too worried about running plays and I could never be present and really put it all together. But I would, my, my, re my answer to that was work harder, right? My answer to that was, you know, more weight room, more, more training. But that wasn't the answer I needed and that wasn't the answer for me. And because I never developed that confidence, that led me to, 
I'm going to bring the people pleasing in terms of athletics and the people pleasing in terms of who I surrounded myself with. And I dumbed myself down and I surrounded myself with people that didn't challenge me um, to be a better person. And then I was, you know, partying and then I was drinking every night. And, you know, that was a competition for me. I could out drink anybody. Right. And I would, I would die trying, you know, how much it was enough for me that there wasn't enough. I'm going to drink till it's gone. And that transformed into, you know, other, other substances. And uh, somehow I managed to stay in college for five years. Um, I, I had a medical, medical red shirt one year and I was there my fifth year as soon as my basketball season ended I um I ended and and I, and I failed out of school with you know 14 credits left and to bring that full circle I just got readmitted to my college exactly 10 years later from when I failed out nice. and I'm gonna hopefully finish up in the next couple of months uh this is my slow time we're in the uh, you know middle of January here I train basketball players they're in season right now so this is when I'm you know snowboarding and you know kind of laying low and doing podcasts and this kind of stuff but uh you know I kind of went through some of it but today I, I I train basketball players I didn't always just train basketball players but I'm a hooper I love the game and my vision was to bring the athletic development world and mesh it with the skill acquisition world which when I started doing this eight years ago nobody was doing you have great athletic developers people that can develop athletes and you have great skill developers people that can you know, work on the handle and the jump shot and fine tune the actual skill side of the sport, but nobody does it well under one roof, right? So you're going to have to go to different people, right? And my dream and vision was to mesh the worlds of athletic development and skill acquisition. And I was almost laughed at when I had this idea because people told me to be a specialist in one thing. And my one thing is the complete basketball athlete. So, and I've stuck to my grounds. I, I've, I've traveled the world. I lived in China as a head strength coach for a professional team. I played professionally in the Dominican Republic. I go to Israel a couple of times a year directing basketball camps. And I, I really do, you know, if you're a basketball player, I mean, I could train anybody. My, my love is basketball. But uh, so, you know, if you're a hooper, if you're a basketball player, you want to get stronger, jump higher, we can do that. You want to get bigger, we can do that. You want to work on your jump shot. Yeah, we can do that too. And it's, uh, it's a fluid process. And that's, that's where I'm at. That was a short story. So. I love it. I want to, I want to go into all the, the training talk in a little bit. I want to come back on self-confidence because uh, it, it really seems to be one of the, the pillars, which maybe you were lacking at first, but then you were able to develop what, what allowed you to develop that self-confidence in you over time to get to where you are today? Initially I was broken. Uh, I initially following, following my, my, fears is what led me right I, I was such a fearful scared child that that you know had this whole world out in front of me uh, and my sisters were all so successful I've got an anesthesiologist attorney uh, a nurse practitioner you know I've got and they all knew exactly what they wanted to do since the day they were born well, I like fishing I like hunting you know I don't really like school right so I, I thought I, I thought it was dumb and I thought people were smarter than me which isn't the case. That's just how I felt. So chasing that and, and living out of fear for so long ended up getting me such to the other well where I, I was I was wearing masks. If I perceived you to be smarter than me, right, I was gonna speak with a different vocabulary. If you were a jock or an athlete, you know, I was gonna put but on my jock mask. If you were a teacher, I had a mask for you. You know, and I was always more worried about what you thought about me rather than what I thought about me. You, you didn't have your own down, mask. You know, to, of addiction to wear. Where, no, I didn't know what my own mask was. I was terrified. So my, like, my greatest fear was that if you knew who I really was, you wouldn't like me, right? If you knew who, who like I'm a soft, gentle person. I'm a caring person. I'm a passionate person. I want to serve people. I love getting people better. I, I, you know, I'll hold the door open. That was always who I was in, you know, innately. But I was that person doesn't do well being a gentle giant in high school in North New Jersey where I live. That person gets bullied. You know, that person doesn't get girls, right? The, the people that I wanted to be like were at the cool table, right? And again, that led me to addiction. That, that led me to being, uh, say I was a heroin addict. I, I stole from all the closest people in my life, not because I was a bad person, I was a sick person and I, and I was addicted. And, and in my mind, it was, I had no other choice. And I didn't get help for a long time because again, I was scared with people. It was a secret, like I was getting high by myself and I was terrified to think what my successful family would think about me. Um, so to get to where I'm at, I ended up getting in a lot of trouble. Um, I, I went to jail for uh, punching a guy in the face for no reason. I, um, 
and I mean, I got sober, you know, because I went to jail and, and I spent 23 days, you know, disconnected from where I was and all the triggers and stuff like that. And that was like, finally, the, like, it, it was, you know, finally, finally, you know, I don't think I would have ever turned myself in. I probably would have died before I got honest. But, you know, that for me, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a believer. You know, I have, faith is the strongest thing in my life. That was God doing something for me that, you know, I could have never done. And uh, once it was out, once my parents knew, I was like, I want help. Get me help. What do I need to do to get better? And uh, I surrounded myself with people that knew how to live better than I did. And I listened. I didn't talk much. I didn't know. I didn't have anything to say. Right. And I knew that I was so broken, so defeated that I, I had nothing to say anymore. There were no more excuses. There was no more, you know, surface level stuff. I had to get to what, why I felt the way I did. And that wasn't going to happen, like I said, until I was absolutely broken and destroyed, almost on my deathbed. And then from there, once I could admit that I was broken, that I was destroyed, that made me be able to open up my ears and, and listen to people that loved me for no reason. And my, and my mom was, you know, she, she's also, my mom's in recovery. She's been sober for like 35 years. So she knew exactly where to put me and who to surround me with. And those people just loved me until I started to love myself. And it, People in general, not just addicts, not just people that struggle with mental health, humans in general, we, we like to create scripts and stories that, that, that we live by. I'm this way because of this incident. I'm this way because this happened to me. I'm mean because my dad was mean. That doesn't mean we need to stay that way. That doesn't mean it's okay. But we like to justify our actions based on something that happened in our life. And it doesn't it doesn't need to be that way. You, you don't need to be who you are. You don't need to act this way because your dad beat you as a kid. No matter how bad, my story is horrible. I did horrible, horrible things that I'm not going to get into in addition to stealing like worse, right? That doesn't mean I need to live like a scumbag the rest of my life. And now it's just a, like, an, I like to describe it as an ever narrowing road. Who in my life do, is, is not on this journey with me? And, and I'll make a list of people in my life, right? Who, who's, who's, on, who's on this journey? Right, not that we're all on exactly the same journey, but who is trying to walk down this ever narrowing road? Who is trying to really get better? Who's trying to serve others? And it just gets narrower and narrower, and I just keep cutting fat off, cutting fat off me personally. What what character defects do I have that are no longer serving my vision? Right, and I'm constantly trying to just cut that crap out of my life. Did I answer anything you said? Yeah, absolutely, man. It's uh, it's great to hear you, you know, talk about this with so much perspective. What was your, your process in rebuilding yourself uh, after this, this wake up call? Um, listening, listening. I, I had to listen. I, I had to find people that had what I wanted. Right. And then I was an open book. I, I, what I did knew you want? I, I wanted to be happy. I was miserable stealing from people. I, I wanted happiness. So I was fortunate enough to be able to surround myself with people that weren't not about money, not about prestige, that were happy. And I would look for people in the training world that weren't just successful, were happy. I would look for people that had things that I wanted. And I got to a point where I felt okay saying, I don't know anything. Can you help me? Right? I'm a broken human being. Like I believe everybody's a broken human being or flawed human being. Right? I'm just, I got to a point because I was so broken that I couldn't lean on my own understanding anymore, right? I knew my own understanding was flawed. I knew the way I approached the world was wrong. So if by admitting that I'm wrong, that I'm flawed, that opened me up to putting positive things in. But it wasn't until, right? It wasn't until that I admitted that, that I could. So for me, it was, um, I knew at one point in my life, I loved working out. Now for a long time, I wasn't working out. I wasn't doing anything. I was just doing drugs, right? So I, that's something positive. Every day I'm going to work out. I knew at one point in my life, I like to write and journal. All right. Every day I'm going to journal and I'm going to get these crazy thoughts down on paper. I knew at one point in my life, I, I like to hang out with friends. So, you know, these are all different areas of my life. So who are positive influences on me? Who are the friends that I haven't talked to in 10 years? Because when I went to doing drugs, they stayed true to their morals right? And I reached back out to those people. I reached, I was fortunate when I was uh, in high school and college and playing that I had unbelievable trainers on both the skill development and athletic development side of things. I reached out to them, hey, what do I have to do to work for you? And I started apprenticeships or internships and worked for nothing, right? But I surrounded myself with successful people. And I had, no, you know, I was, I didn't have a college degree. I knew I loved basketball and I knew I loved working out. 
And I'm like, this is the only thing that makes any bit of sense to me that I could possibly do. And uh, so I started, you know, I just started. I started training people. I started getting certifications. I started reading literature on, on, on training. I started, um, I started asking questions and not saying, not thinking I know better, right? Just listening. And I, I was, again, fortunate. I was blessed to grow up where I grew up. I know how many people don't have the resources that I had. But growing up in a suburban, you know, pretty well-off neighborhood, I had unbelievable resources. And now I was confident enough to go to them and be like, hey, I don't really know what's going on, but can you help me? It, do you, how underrated do you feel the skill of, ask, of saying I don't know is as a coach today? It's the most underrated. If you know everything, you don't know anything. Like I hate like those people. I know exact. I can follow somebody on like if somebody in a fur in one conversation. I know if I'm going to get along with like already. I know I'm going to get along with you. I can see the smile on your face. I can see your setup. I, I like I don't need that. I haven't. This is the first conversation I've ever had with you, but I can see that you're passionate about this by by your by, by your face, right? By your smile, right? And. I, I, I can tell the other side of things when somebody isn't genuine, when somebody's out there for followers or money or whatever. So, and, and it, the sad part is there is very little barrier to entry in our, uh, in our profession. And as long as you know a little bit more or you're a little, not even know a little bit more, if you're more confident than the consumer, right? You can sell them on ignorant confidence, right? You can, get a product, have some famous guy hold that product. And that's really, ha that, that's marketing today. Let's come up with something. Let's put it in the hands of uh, a famous athlete, celebrity, right? And make them and pay them to say they like this. And they sell millions of dollars worth of product. Or, you know, let's develop a jump program and get, you know, world-class athletes to come film for a weekend then that ha i'm not making this up i know this happens i've mm -hmm. seen it happen and i'm tempted to do it sometimes because i'm like <laughs> it's really that easy right like it, it, but, yeah and then and then it's uh, yeah it's about deciding what what person you want to be and what what is you know what is your truth and how do you want to live it and are you are you ready to to get to or to do that to get to where you want to get to right yeah. And so to say, I don't know, I say, I don't know all the time. I can't, you know, uh, my knees bother me. What's going on? You know, now I can put them through a movement. I can look at everything, but you know, a lot of times the answer is, you know, I don't know, go see a therapist. Now I used to try to play therapist way more than I should have as a young trainer. You know, I, I can, I studied the body. I know what can cause me. Now it's like, that's not what I was. I decided, you know, eight years into doing this full time. I don't want to get into pain right? I, it's, there's better people than me. Could I, mm. can I figure it out? Yeah. But if I have six athletes there and I'm focused, because I, I work semi privately, right. And you have knee pain. It's a lot easier for me to be like, Hey, why don't you take a week off from me and go see my buddy down the street who's a phenomenal therapist? Well, he will give you one-on-one -on -one attention. Right. And I used to do more one-on-one -on -one training. So I did more of that kind of, you know, stuff, rehabilitative, whatever. And now I don't, I, I don't know. You know, I, I think I might know, but I don't. And even the therapist doesn't know. He just has more experience with that than I do. So, um, you know, I'm, I don't know. And I refer him to somebody that doesn't know, but let him deal with it. That's his, you know, he's got the, the doctor next to his name. So, so that's, that's the part you don't know, or you, you would rather not venture out saying that you do. What are you confident saying that you do know? I know I'm going to do everything I can for you. You walk into my gym and I know this not I'm not saying this haphazardly I'm not saying this on some ego trip I'm saying this because these are the reviews that I get these people parents dads family members they come to me and tell me how much I'm impacting their child's life right this is this happens to me on a daily basis I get my high school athletes who are some of the best athletes in the country at this point sending me you know we have I don't let everybody get my personal number because I, I really focus at this level where I'm at now. I focus, I have, I was, you know, a group of about 20 kids that I really put my all into. And if you're one of those 20 kids, right. I, it, it's every, and I have other trainers underneath me now that also do the same thing that I do. But if it's getting into college, you know, I'll, you, you you're not just using me for that hour. You come to me. I'm going to, I'm going to be part of your life now. Like you, you come into my gym. Yeah. You're going to come in three to six hours a week in my gym, but you're getting me the 180, 178 hours, you know, in a week you're, you're getting me. I'm, I'm there. If you're in here. You, I'm on your team. I don't care. You know, you come in, you're a bad kid. You don't listen. I'm on your team. We're going to change that. And 
I, I, I tell hard truths. I don't tell kids what I think they want to hear. I tell them what they need to hear. And I, I lost a lot of kids along the way doing that, but now I have a culture, right? So it's a, it's a slower path than getting a celebrity to endorse me, right? Which I could do. Like I have guys, I have huge, like I have them, right? But I don't use that. I, I treat that guy the same way as I treat, you know, a, a, four, a 14 year old girl learning the game. If I'm going to give you my time, I'm, you're in front of me, I'm serving you. What's been your, the evolution yeah. of your perspective on, uh, skill acquisition and athletic development since you started coaching? Um, I, lo I, I know less now than I knew eight years ago. You know, the, <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of cliche at this point, right? The more I know, the less I, you know, the less I understand or, you know, however they say it. Yeah. I, you know, I came in and I, I was a pretty accomplished basketball player. And the, the more I learn, it's, I'm, I err more, I'm a lot quieter today. I coach, I verbally coach a lot less than I used to. When I talk, there is great, there's way more meaning and depth behind to the words that I choose to use or the mannerisms or the tone, right? I, I, I cue, like, I'm insanely aware of the vocabulary, the tone, the methods that I, if, if I'm verbally cueing or verbally, like coaching, right? I'm insanely aware and I insanely question everything I, that comes out of my mouth. If I'm in the gym for five hours in a night, right? I, I, I don't write this down. I don't need to. It's the way my brain works. On the 30-minute drive home, I'm rehashing the night. How did I talk to this kid? How did he react to the way I said that? And I pay attention. And I sometimes I just, you know, throw crap against the wall just to see what happens. And it's, it's, it's me studying humans, right? So with skill acquisition, athletic development, I record, right? I, I used to be way more, I had an entire assessment process where we would, I would test 9,000 things and I lost kids because of that because it was boring on the first day. So now I'm more just, you know, come in a group, if it's a good fit, we'll get the assessment done, but I'm not rushed to do it. But where I'm at now is a place uh, I'm exploring and I want to create an atmosphere and a culture of of creativeness, of exploration, where there isn't one, it's a lot of, it depends. It's like, is this right? How does it feel? There, there, there is no right or wrong. There is no black or white. How does it feel? What did you experience? What are you feeling right? Do you, you know, you've been training with me for three months. Do you feel better? Not really. Uh, so what are we missing here? And then I could take that athlete off to the side and, and we can do a whole analysis of, of, of what his, his life looks like. Because again, if he's seeing me three hours a week, there's another 175 hours in the week, right? that are unaccounted for. What are you doing? Those are more important than the three hours with me. I could have, you know, a program that guarantees 18 inches on your vertical jump. Well, first you can't do that. No, I can't have that program. But hey, let's say I did, right? That guarantees this amount of success, but you go home and you sleep two hours a night, your dad's beating you and you eat Mountain Dew with cereal for breakfast. I don't know if you have Mountain Dew where you are. I know what it is. Soda for, <laughs> so, soda for breakfast, right? right? So that's kind of where I'm at. Um, I, my, my strength development is I focus on structure. I've, you know, I've gone through uh, functional range systems and all that kind of stuff and uh, all the, a bunch of different movement things. And I, uh, I'm focused on structure. My, my weight room stuff is, is very simple. We do a lot of single leg. We do a lot of, you know, push-ups, pull-ups. Uh, you know, we hit all the different, you know, big movements, the simple movements, and we do them a lot. You know, my favorite guys in this industry are the ones that just nail the basics. So I want to hammer the basics, right? Especially with basketball players. It's such a variable sport. There's so much change of direction. There's so much jumping. There's so much speed, you know, more neural, you know, poppy, like, stuff that what I can do in the weight room is, sure, we, you know, we can put on some muscle. We can put on some size. But let's build the house, right? Let, let, let's work on tissue resiliency. Let's work on, you know, maybe that's our time where we talk more. Right. Because it's not when I'm on the court, I'm a madman. Right. So the weight room, we can talk about how's your season going? How's your at home life? And our, the lift I'm doing a one by, you know, Dr. Yes, this uh, one by 20 mm -hmm. uh, program. So, yeah. I, you know, I, it's kind of what I'm doing now. I'm not saying it's the best, but I'm seeing great results and I might get bored. You know, I, I have my own version of his version of somebody else's version. Right. But I'm hitting, you know, a lot of different movements and we do them three days a week and the kid gets and these, I'm. Most of my athletes are 14 to 18 year old, pretty high level basketball players. 
but that doesn't mean they're high level, you know, lifters, you know, they can come in and throw a 360 dunk and hit a half court shot. But does that mean they're competent in a, you know, a pistol squat or a push up or any of these things that I think are basic aren't basic to them. So I don't need a Vertimax. I don't need Bosu balls and like this stuff that isn't not that it's necessarily bad. It's like, these kids can't stand on one foot or touch their toes or do a pull up. Why am I breaking out a Vertimax and a Bosu ball and, you know, some other new gadget, right. To sell them. Cause that's what they're doing when, you know, I could get this guy, we could probably just do Bulgarian split squats three days a week and, you know, pick a couple up for body and just hammer those. And, you know, there's nobody at division one basketball, NBA basketball. Does anybody care how much those guys bench press? Can do they even bench press? Yeah, Most of them know. The I know the guys. They don't <laughs> basket high level basketball players. There are very few that are savages in the weight room. Like no, it's not a it's not an important thing. You got guys like Giannis and or Jordan and people. Look, well, he went in the weight room to put on. Yeah, that's one. It's a couple examples, and they were great before they did that. And Giannis would have been great. You know, he put on size, but he he was more about learning the the sport, right? So yeah, he's you he put on fifty pounds and three years of muscle but you know he was great before that and he would have been great regardless maybe he's a little bit better now because he's got more weight to throw around but watch old video of him he moved like a gazelle. He, he moved effortlessly at seven foot two now he's just bigger like that's easy anybody gets bigger my one of my favorite quotes you know the guy cleaning up the gym gets bigger it's true <laughs> and i used to be so again i'm going off on tangent i used to like you know everything was neutral spine, this, that like your, your deadlift had to look like the, the textbook deadlift. One, we don't really deadlift too much anymore because again, I'm training basketball athletes, right? And that's a complicated thing. And to do it the way that I think isn't going to hurt them might be wasting more time than if I just had them do a single leg pistol squat or some other, you know, single, you know, dumbbell, whatever mm -hmm. variations that are, they, they pick up easier. Let's, let's get to things that are going to create progress, actual mm -hmm. progress faster then it will teach me, then it will take me to teach them a highly technical compound movement like a, like a deadlift. Today's episode is sponsored by Strength Coach Network, the number one education and networking platform for strength and conditioning coaches. Strength Coach Network offers over 200 hours of video education delivered by elite level presenters such as Dan Pfaff, Jada Mayo, Derek Hansen, Carl Dietz, and Buddy Morris. If you work with or want to work with team sport athletes and take your coaching to the next level, you will find everything you need to know on topics such as speed development, plyometric training, conditioning, rehab, program design, and much, much more. Strength Coach Network also allows you to interact with hundreds of coaches from all over the world, ranging from top NFL, NBA, and MLB coaches all the way to the grassroots level. You can ask questions, respond to popular threads, and get valuable insight from the best in the business. Strength Coach Network also covers career and business development tailored specifically for coaches. If you want a resume critique, need to get ready for an interview, or are looking for professional networking advice, go to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash upside to get your first month at half price. That's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash upside. Yeah, it's, it's really great having someone like you on that sees both sides that sees the athletic development side and then the skills component of the sport because i obviously talk to a lot of uh strength and conditioning coaches uh, on the podcast that's that's kind of what i do but at the end of the conversation we often get to the point where well with, all this is great but you know what effect is it going to have on the actual sport and that's where you come in the skills coach and and at the end of the day that's where you make the difference on the court and in many sports obviously some sports are more reliant on your physical development thinking about rugby and, and stuff like that but even then you get masters of the sport that don't have outstanding physical qualities but they just read the game and play the game better than everybody else right they, they process you, you watch these guys that there are, I could name a bunch of them, but there, there, there's a lot of highly successful, not that athletic guys that just, I mean, I think an easy example right now is Tom Brady. Mm -hmm. The guy's 44 years old and he's competing for a Super Bowl, right? That's the guy, he was never, never, even now he's 44. And he, like, it's not like he was, you know, some world-class athlete and now he's 44. I can, that would make sense. He never had any, t watch the guy run. He was an out of shape guy coming out of college and he's probably the greatest quarterback of all time. I hate him. I'm not a, I'm not a Tom Brady guy, 
but like, like he's the greatest ever and he's not that great of an athlete. What is that? Right. How do we, that, where that, those are the outliers, right? I love studying outliers, both on the athletics, out, athletic outliers, insane athletes, like Usain Bolt or, you know, anybody pick it in that spectrum. And then also outliers on like the Brady side of things. Like, what did they do? How, how do they, like, why, how do they process information? How, you know, then you look at leadership skills and, and, and things like that, the intangible, people call them intangibles. And that's where I even start to question, are those qualities intangible? People, you can't teach vision. You can't teach pace. You can't teach the men. Are you sure? Like, is that, I think that's just, again, one of those things, scripts or stories that people have been saying for generations that is there evidence to back up that we cannot teach kids to process the game faster? Is it, can we really not teach confidence? Is that true? Again, I don't know. And there, I'm going to come back to it. I don't know, but I am going to try my best to figure it out because I see kids start to process things faster. I, whether I can write it down on a graph and you can't, I, I, because I'm in, the, I'm in the weight room and then I'm on the court with my athletes and, and more of a skill setting, I can see the progress. And if I was just doing the weight room, I wouldn't be able to connect the dots. And I, I know when I make a small change in a program or a small change in how I teach things or a small change in um, the way I approach the skill side of things, I, I, I mentally record what works and what doesn't. I'm constantly refining that process. And again, now it's a more creative and explore. I want these kids to just explore. Right. I, I, I want them to get uncomfortable and, and realize it's OK to be uncomfortable and not just uncomfortable, like intimidated confidence things like put them in vulnerable positions and or like, you know, game modify different games for them to play and figure out and rely on each other and communicate and do all these things that, you know, are, quote unquote, unteachable. Right. I want I don't want just resiliency in terms of their tissue, in terms of their body. I want resiliency in their confidence i want resiliency in their mind i want resiliency in how they see themselves when they wake up in the morning every morning what do you see when you're brushing your teeth do you see somebody that isn't capable of great things do you really believe that you're put on this earth for a reason and what i do i think I, again i don't hear i do i do surround myself with people that are similar to me but i don't meet many people that that have a conversation similar that we're having right now right how do we progress this? How do we teach these things that are thought to be unteachable or innate, right? It's do, do you think maybe that's, maybe, that, maybe that's just an excuse because they're, they're harder to develop than putting 10 pounds on someone's back squat? Is it harder to develop or is it just not looked at because we get so obsessed with a 40-inch vert or 400 pound deadlift or 600 pound squat and we for the last since Arnold Schwarzenegger wrote his book on bodybuilding everything has become about bodybuilding when you look at old gym classes back in the day they had ropes they had you know the old school like phys ed elementary gym was more like military boot camp climbing things rubber tire all these different things that you're exploring different movement patterns getting hit with different things you used to be able to play dodgeball we can't play dodgeball anymore we're just taking the human element out of everything and trying to i made up a word roboticize right like humans that. right we're, we are creating robots the best athletes on this world were also called uncoachable tiger woods uncoachable michael jordan uncoachable kobe bryant uncoachable name you know I'm sh these guys were, sh they, they had supreme confidence that they knew better than not. Yeah, you could tell me that, but I'm going to do my own thing. And that label of uncoachable is what made them great, you know. And uh, it, it had more to do with their confidence. They, like they, they, did, they were doing things differently than anybody else. Currently, and we'll, we'll maybe – narrow that down to basketball since that that's the field that you're in predominantly right now how much do you think how much sacrifice so how much potential sorry is sacrificed for uh, because of that maybe overemphasis of the physical development of athletes versus time spent on court maybe if you look at a week of a you know a high schooler right now how is it split up court versus weight room and is that split ref yeah. reflecting the needs of the athlete So it's a great, great question. I don't think it's about allocation of their time. For 
for many of them. So there are the lazy ones, right? There are those guys that could benefit from eat more of either, right? There's a lot of those. I don't personally have many of those. They don't last with me. They, they, they I have a, I have the stat, there's a culture, right? I'm going to call you out whether you're, you know, trying to play in the NBA or a third grade boy. You're not like I, I establish, right? So I don't deal with many of the lazy people. And if you're lazy, I call you lazy. You're just late. Oh, my mom said, no, not your mom. You're lazy. You eat too many potato chips. You play too much video games. All right. You're, my jump shot, I'm having a bad day shooting. No, you're just not a good jump shooter. This is normal stuff that I say. And I know that's not normal in other gyms, right? But it, I, I do it with a smile on my face, right? I, I'm a jerk, but I'm a friendly, like, sarcastic. <laughs> a friendly jerk. And whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can justify it any way I want. I run my own business. So if you don't like it, go right? No, I love my kids. I love them passionately, right? So it's, again, so there are those lazy people. I call them out. Now, in terms of allocation of time, I'm more concerned about the quantity, uh, the, not the quantity. I'm more concerned about the quality mm -hmm. of the time and, and, and addressing their needs. So I think there, which I feel hot, bad for is the, the hardworking kids out there that are underserved. Mm -hmm. And I think any sport, any place right now there's a large amount of kids waiting to be inspired that aren't being inspired right i we, we want to say kids are lazy and i just called kids like kid humans are lazy okay not kids kids are kids it's not their job right they need to be and you know what if it's a lazy kid he's a lazy parent right that's why he's lazy he comes into my gym and if he lasts a couple of weeks he's not gonna be lazy anymore because I don't stop. I don't change. I'm not lazy. I work my butt off, right, to get to where I am. And if you want to be good, you're going to work your butt off, too. And if you don't want to, go somewhere else that's going to tell you, you know, it's okay to be chubby. And I, I don't call kids out for being fat. I don't know why I said that. I would, I would say, like, you eat too many potato chips or something. But it, so it's more about, like, there, everything has gotten to – all right, so I, I'll use the basketball world. You go into a gym other than mine, most, I'll say, some high percentage of gyms, 90-something percent of gyms other than mine, and you say a basketball player. What do you think the first thing they're going to do with that person is? In the weight room. With a basketball player. What are they doing? What are they working on? I don't know. Squats? Squat. <laughs> Jumping. Okay. Yeah. You, have a, you, have a, you have a basketball player. And in America, where in Jersey, where I am, if if you're any type of basketball, everybody specializes early now. They all do it. Right. They play basketball 365 days a year. All right, describe the sport of basketball to me. What do they do hundreds of times a day if you're playing the game of basketball? They jump. What are you doing? Jump. Jump shot, right? A Euro step is a jump. A dunk is a jump. Jump ball. You are jump. The whole sport is jumping. So you're going to take a kid that jumps hundreds, if not thousands of times a week, and you're going to bring them into your gym and you're going to have them box jump because that's what that kid thinks he needs to do. He does it. He's a kid. It's not his fault. That's what I thought. I want to work on jumping. I got to go jump more than I'm already. Like you don't even think about it because it's a sport, right? So the, and that would make sense. And that's, I used to jump people in the weight room and then it, well, something happened. I'm like, why? right? Why? He's already jumping. Do I want to see how he jumps? Do I want to see how he moves? Yeah, as a diagnostic tool. All right, so maybe we need to, you know, work on some things, work on some positional stuff, work on some, you know, whatever, connecting things. And I have an assessment that's full of jumping to see where they're at, to see if there's a disconnect from the upper body, the lower body, to see their impact control, how well they, you know, recycle energy. And I, and I have all this testing to see it, but do they really need to jump more, right? So I think the whole idea people say like you know their their athletic development are you really developing the athlete because you take an athlete in that is pounding his body you know it's a, it's a high speed high rate of force development uh deceleration jumping very very wild game and you're just doing more of what he's already getting and i don't think many people look at it from that perspective we want to give him what he thinks he needs which is more jumping up but let's and let's load the jumping too we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna strap them to bands. We're gonna put a weight vest on. We're gonna have them jump on a Bosu ball, do a backflip, and kick a freaking you know something, <laughs> right? And the kid can't do a push up. The kid can't touch his toes. You ask him to do some barefoot stuff, 
and he and he falls down, right? And again, I it, it there there needs to be more conversations like this because I think it's pretty rational. Mm-hmm. And I think if me and if maybe you're not a big basketball guy, but you can think of the sport and then start to think of what does he really need in the weight room? That's why I began this whole conversation with talking about structure, right? Let, let, let's, you know, let's work on structure. Yeah. Lay, lay the foundation, up. lay the foundation. That's and then it. like you said, build, build the house and then you can fill the rooms with what happens on the court. Cause like you said, I mean, I'd rather someone, I, I don't work with any basketball players, at least not right now, but if I did, I'd rather they spend their time jumping on the court with a ball in their hands because that's going to be right. more, you know, appropriate for the sport so, than, than isolating it in the gym as a, as a physical quality all by itself with no, with no context because that's really what it is. The court is context. And then, like you said, to read the game, to look at the, where you are in the court, uh, where, are your, where are your opponents, where are your, uh, your, team, your, your teammates, uh, and that's going to be how you develop the, the division as well and, and everything that goes with it, not, not on a jump mat in a gym. No, yeah. So that's funny. A kid comes in and, and we have his first, you know, day and I have a whole line of questioning to get to know him. Right. And you know, why are you here? I want to jump higher. And even that, do you want to jump higher or do you want to dunk? He goes, what do you mean? I said, you said you want to jump higher. Do you really want to jump higher or do you really want to dunk? He goes, well, I guess I just want to dunk. Like, see, that's completely different, right? Could, right? There, there's a skill piece to dunking, yeah. right? I, there, there are people with 40-inch verts, and you put a basketball in their hand, and they have no idea what to do with it, right? Because, you know, now you don't get that arm swing. Like, there's, there's a whole bunch of components that change the second you put a ball in somebody's hand, right? So what you just said about if I had a basketball player, I'd much rather work on the court. Me too. Now there's going to, you know, maybe if I'm doing some type of French contract and again, I'm not doing this with lower level, you know, younger kids really as much as, a, as I used to, or I don't really ever get too much into that. But if I'm doing some type of contrast training, mm-hmm. I'm looking for a specific adaptation, right? Yeah, I may. But now that I have the court right next to my weight room, I could even, you know, I would argue that why am I, so I'd probably put a ball in my hand anyway, if I was doing contrast training, you know, I, I don't see the downside. Yeah, and that, that's probably it's interesting that you interesting interesting. I'll get that. I'll get it. Interesting that you say that your weight room is right next to the court because I feel like the more you can bring the two closer together, obviously with while respecting you know what happens here and what happens there, I feel like there's maybe still too much separation between those two worlds. And again, it's great to have someone like you that lives in both uh, because otherwise it's. Uh, you know, strength and conditioning coaches on one side and then skills coaches on the other. And there there probably needs to be a lot more, like you said, a communication between the two sides. Yeah, I don't know why everybody's not doing it. <laughs> you know, like, I, I, it's hard. You have, you know, there, there's a science to both. And that's, it's funny because the, I think the strength guys will become skill guys so easily, right? The, mm-hmm. They're the real good strength guys. Because I, I, they're already into the, the books and the knowledge and the certs and like you know we want we could geek out over you know bench press whatever it is right and different modalities right just you know go like it wouldn't take much for anybody to start training basketball players watch the sport take what you know of the body of movement of this and and go at it right go at it I think it's harder for the skill guys to come over to the athlete just because the what I see the demographic of skills trainers aren't the ones that are in books, mm-hmm. right? Aren't the ones that they're more, well, I played ball for 20 years. So, you know, this is what I did. Right. They're, not that there aren't skill guys. And when the, the guys that I do see the skill guys that are, you know, up for echelon, whatever, they're more into like the entrepreneurial, the mindset, like, which is awesome. But all they would have to do, in my opinion, is pick up a Dan John Easy Strength or a Cal Dietz Triphasic Training or, you know, go get some certification just to get your, you know, your beak wet, right? And um, it, it's not that hard. Like, you don't need to, you know, go get a PhD in exercise science. Go, you know, there's plenty of easily digestible books out there. Anybody that's listening to this, reach out to me. I'll send you a list of, you know, 100 books. Like, just do like you that's the thing yeah you say you're you're in it for the development of the athlete how much are you developing your knowledge right if you're not if you're not growing as a trainer if you're not learning more 
and you're just recycling the same things that your coach told you 20 years ago. Do you really have the best interest of your athlete? Like, I think for me to serve my athletes, that I need to keep learning. I need to keep saying, I don't know, right? That, that is, in my opinion, the only way that I can continue to walk this narrowing road I talked about and become a better servant to my, because I, I, that's why I'm a servant. I want to be a servant, right? And to do that, I need to keep admitting I know nothing and keep reading. <laughs> what do you what do you feel it can be done better currently in the skill on the skill development side in basketball specifically? <laughs> It's gonna be a I should write a, a thesis on this. <laughs> um, what, I I don't even know where to start. To be honest, what needs to change in this? Uh, so we'll say in basketball. Yeah, and skills specifically. Yeah. Other than what I said before, which was a pretty much blanket statement that I think it's dumb that skill coaches don't learn about the human body, right? Mm -hmm. Or read books on skill acquisition because there's plenty of literature out there on skill acquisition and what is that in motor learning and dynamic systems and all this different thing that really, I mean, it might sound complicated because those are a couple of big words, but it's really not. Like get kids to explore the movement capabilities and try new things and they're going to learn and pick up new skills. I think that's as easy as I can say it, right? Mm -hmm. So what do I see missing is that. I, I'll use the, the, the robotic term that I use, but roboticizing these kids where it's crossover at this cone, do a behind the back at this cone, do a spin move at this cone, and then jump from this spot. No, that's not basketball, right? That is not the sport, and that is not going to have transfer to the competition. That's what I did in high school, and that's what I was good at. But when it came to 10 guys on the court, a coach yelling at me, fans cheering my name or calling me out, And it can't when that doesn't withstand the pressure of competition, mm -hmm. right? So how can we build resilient minded effortless athletes that can withstand the pressures of competition? Right. And that is my framework of thinking for how I approach every single thing I do in the gym when it comes to skill development. How is this going to prepare them for what they're going to see when they compete? Right. Now, younger beginners, right, lower level athletes my job with them is to inspire them and that's when I become you know a, uh, a role model a mentor a, a funny guy somebody you know if I have a I, we have some you know third fourth grade kids walk into the gym am I gonna no I want them to love the sport that I love I want them to see the joint competition so that's where I get I gamify everything you know and, and I, I don't want so I walk into gyms right in town like little like local rec you know le local leagues or whatever and I'll and I'll watch a practice at the end of a practice And there'll be a line of six kids on one side and a line of six kids on the other side. And then the one kid is going up, you know, for his layup or whatever move. And then the other guy is getting the rebound. But you have 10 children standing. Right. Is that the best use of their time? You have 10. There's 12 guys, whatever. For this example, there's 12 kids. Two are actively in the drill. And then there's 10 standing there picking their noses whatever not paying any attention not engaged not you know not even deep practice not even you know surface level practice There, there's nothing happening to them for 10 of the kids They're, and I see it all the time this is like I walk into a gym this is what I see because uh, some father is coaching some dad is coaching or whatever and literally there's 10 kids standing there not paying any attention that's not right you you have one hour with these kids So the hour, like I have rules, my trainer, A, B, D, always be dribbling. Our beginner groups, everybody in that kid, if they're waiting in line, they're A, B, D, always be dribbling. They're just dribbling. You better be dribbling, right? If you're not dribbling, you know, this ain't for you. Go home, play Fortnite, go play video games, right? So yeah. just things like that. Get them moving. It's like, is, is there complicated things that, like, I – think about and yes but what I prescribe or what I actually do is you know get everybody doing the sport what's the sport basketball okay let's get all the kids playing basketball you know if they're there for an hour let's have them doing something basketball related for an hour you know and at that level it might be crossover at this cone it might be spin move it might be some of that right because it, it can keep them organized and keep them on topic but um yeah let, let, let's play basketball One of, the, one of the greatest things that I saw was uh, while I was taking a, a rugby course, one of the instructors here in Switzerland is probably the best coach I've, I've ever seen coach rugby. And it was a class of kids and they were 
I believe they were five and six years old and they'd never played the game. And he set it up in such a way that within an hour, they were not tackling and stuff, but they were pretty much playing rugby with all the complicated rules that it involves just by layering games on games and ball in hand and confidence and, and laughter. And he, he said, the first thing he said when he got there, I'll never forget that he said, so guys, uh, I want you to know one thing before we start. I'm a magician. And so anytime, yeah. anytime I say uh, candle, everybody has to go like this and you can't move until I say, and he picked another word. And all the kids just were like mesmerized by this guy who just showed up and said he was a magician. And then from there, they were, you know, they listened and they played and they laughed and they had a great time. And, you know, most of them understood the game of rugby without even knowing that that's what they were doing uh, by the end of the hour. And like you said, that's, that's probably a lot more appropriate for the kids that age and even, even older to learn and explore and have a good time than to, than to, you know, be put in that frame of the drill sergeant and this is how it's going to be done in A to B. Yeah. And I, I think at that age, and I would argue again, any age, my, you know, one of my main jobs is, is to be the ignition. I don't know if you ever read Talent Code by Daniel Coyle, and, and he yeah. talks about ignition, right? And being being that ignition. And, and I read that, and, I, and it would be, you know, one baseball player from the Dominican Republic or, you know, one person that, that made everybody think it was possible, right? And now with my story of being a drug addict and, you know, being just, you know, scum of the earth or whatever to, to where I'm at now, it, I look at myself as a miracle, right? I do. I look at myself as a miracle. And I can now knowing I've overcome, let's say, tragedy, I've, a tragedy, I've overcome these things. I know that I have done miraculous things with my life at this point. And I say that as humbly as I can, not look at me, look how miraculous I am. I know the amount of people that have died, right? Like I have friends die all the time, right? People have died that live similar to me. Many, most of them do, and most of them never get better. So I am a, a, a percentage, right? A very small, miraculous percentage of people that go through the addiction that I went through and come out and see the other side, right? And now I can use that passion for overcoming obstacles to be that ignition, to ignite young kids. And for younger kids, it might be calling myself a magician. Or for me, I, you know, I, I, it's funny you said magician. I usually go around like I'm a terminator. Right. Right. I'm a terminator. You must you must obey me. Because I'm a terminator. Like, what's a terminator? I said, like a bionic machine. Right? What do you mean? And I could give me the ball and I'll go up and dunk the ball or something like that. Right. And then, oh, my gosh, you can dunk. Yeah, that's what terminators do. Right. And, I, you know, I, and I can just I don't like doing that, honestly, too many hours because I get like, uh, you know, I can only stay in that. But like if I, if I work with beginners, one or two hours a week is about my cutoff. But I love those one or two hours. Once mm -hmm. it's like five hours, it's too much with the young kids because um, I can't. I don't know. I don't always like to be like that showy. I get, I don't know. Just they're they're all nuts, the little ones. But I like I love it one or two hours a week. When you, you talked about, you know, developing or letting the kids explore, and what came to mind is that it does require some confidence in yourself as, as a child, as an athlete, to allow yourself to not just abide by those stringent rules of go from cone A to cone B and do this and do that. So how do you help the kids that you work with build that confidence so that they allow themselves, I guess, to free themselves from that rigid frame and allow themselves to explore and, and try and fail safely to, to then get better. So it's funny to, to lose the rigid frame. I establish rigid constraints, but here are my constraints or here are my, my rules. Here are my, like I, I, again, I, I, I speak a, a bold truth all right, to my kids. Okay. And on day one, right. These are my expectations. I expect you to mess up. I expect you to kick the ball off your foot. All right. Now, I also expect you to look at me with eye contact and heads nodding when I talk. Okay. Eye contact, heads nodding, and I make them all do it. Right. So we're going to mess up. You're going to kick the ball off your foot. And when I speak, you listen. All right. Other than that, let's go. All right. And now I put them in positions that challenge them, right? Whether I'm, you know, modifying the constraints of a drill. And, you know, I'm, again, I get into 
what is the specific adaptation that I'm after? With a young kid, it's, well, it, the first one is let's ignite them. Let, let's get them to love basketball. Because when I'm excited about something, like there's a, there's a pizza spot down the street and I love it. I'm telling everybody about that pizza. That's just who I am, right? I, I get a new car and it's, it's a good car. Like, and not that it's a flash or whatever. You got to get this. This thing's awesome, right? I'm just very, like, proud of things that I find. Like, it's like, you know, I'll find a new mountain that we're still, or you got to check out this mountain or this one run, right? That's who I am. I, I get very excited and passionate about things that I believe in, right? And so I do that. And, um, yeah. What was your question? I don't know. <laughs> I'm really all over the place. Building confidence in the kids. To allow Building them to yeah, explore. I'm confident. Yeah. They mess, like, so what I, what I want effort right? Give me effort. That's all that. Just give me effort. If you're not going to give me effort, go somewhere else. This is not the place to not give effort. As long as you give me effort, you can do no wrong, right? Don't curse. Don't be a bull. They don't, kids don't do that. I'm the biggest bully in there, right? I will be the biggest bully in there all the time. Nobody's going to out bully Bobby. All right. I'm, I'm the biggest one in there, right? The older the college kids, they, 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 they run at me, right? But again, even the college kids that are now better at basketball than I am, I can put them on the ground, right? And I do. I will. I will wrestle. I will wrestle kids. I will dunk on kids. Right? It, it, we have so much fun. Like I make it. Like it's got to be fun. I, I I've trained at a point when I was younger, seventy hours a week, and it wasn't fun anymore. Right? And now I've completely. And honestly, that's when I I had the job in China. I went to China for six months, and when I came back, I said I'm never going to be that busy again because it wasn't fun anymore. I felt like a slave. Even though I was running my own thing, doing my own thing, I felt like I was a slave to my clients, and I never wanted to feel like that again. So I restructured the way I run business, and now I do, you know, I do, I hired people, right? I was just talking to my friend here, you know, I probably don't make much more money than I did five years ago, but I'm doing this podcast from a mountain, you know, like. <laughs> it doesn't get much know, better than that. No, I, you know, I work, I mean, I'm only in the gym four days a week. Right now, I'm only in the gym three days a week. That doesn't mean I don't work. I work. If I'm up, I'm, my mind's thinking about something, right? That's, that's the way my mind is. If I'm up, I'm, I'm thinking about something. I'm working. I'm, you know, how can I do this better? How can I do That's just how I am. Mm -hmm. But I'm only in the gym right now three days a week, you know? And uh, that's what it's about for me. Like, the same way I want to explore different movement options or movement solutions to, you know, reach an outcome goal, right? I want to explore this life. I want to explore who I am, what I'm made of. That's why I got into snowboarding. Right. I, I think I'm as passionate about snow. I, no, I'm more passionate about snowboarding than I am about basketball. And I, basketball is what puts food on the table for me and my wife. Right. But it, it's a, it, it's about getting better at something. It's about putting, you know, how good, how, like, you know, I'm six foot seven. I'm not your typical snowboarder by any means. Right. I'm, I'm not somebody that you really want to see flying down the mountain at 55 miles an hour. Right. But that's what I'm doing. And I love it. Um, so that's confidence. That, that, that's, you know, that, that, the, the question is confidence. It's not putting on the mask. It's wearing your own mask, putting your own face mm -hmm. on. Who do you see in the mirror? When I wake up in the morning, I brush my teeth. Is that the same person that kisses my wife? Is that the same person I am with, you know, the couple hundred athletes I see a week? Is that the same person I am when I go to church? Is that the same person I am with my friend? Am I, when you see me, Am I who you, ex like, am I Bobby, right? Am I myself? Uh, that's confidence. Being, I, but that takes admitting I don't know. And that's where it comes from. I couldn't come from my flaws. Admitting my flaws from being insanely self-aware and constantly questioning the scripts and stories and emotional reactions I have to things with evidence, Right. Because some days, being what I've been through, whether it's post-traumatic stuff or whatever, my brain, I, like, I hate to go with, I understand, go with your gut, follow your heart. But if you're somebody that's had mental stuff like I have, there are some days my heart says, don't get out of bed. There are some days my brain tells me that I'm no good. I look fat today. You know, I'm six foot, I'm not fat. I know I'm not fat, but there are look in the mirror and I feel fat or I feel ugly. And my wife is beautiful, right? I don't think she'd marry me if I was that ugly, right? You know, or I'm stupid. <laughs> well, what's the evidence to support that I'm stupid, right? Where's the evidence to support that I'm done? I didn't graduate college, but I run a fairly successful business right now. I'm doing this podcast on a, on a, on a mountain parking lot, 
that doesn't sound like somebody that's dumb to me. That sounds like somebody that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So these are things of, that I've learned in therapy from people way smarter than I am, how to just take the emotional, irrational thinking and back it up with evidence, which is it's cognitive behavioral therapy. If anybody wants to go down that rabbit hole Did, and that uh, it's changed my life. The, Sorry to sorry to cut you off on that on that topic. Did you uh, did you work with a with a therapist, or did you also kind of do some reading on the side about that topic for yourself? Both, both. I don't. I'm a skeptic. I I, I am highly skeptical of everybody I talk to. I don't believe you. Like just because you say something does not mean I believe it. There are sir, I, even my best friends, anybody, they say something, and I'm well. How do you know? Where's the, re- you know, where's the research, right? And somebody asked me that, like, I, I don't need the research. I just know, right? But, you know, I'm highly skeptical, but I, I think that's a good quality to have, especially in the, the climate of the world right now, where every time you're on your phone, you're trying to be sold something. Every time you leave, you don't even have to leave your house. People are trying to sell you with a rich celebrity, good looking person on, you know, have abs in 30 days, like, you know, whoever you know and drink this right that it's we live with it it's in our pockets uh, 24 hours a day seven days a week 365 days a year people are trying to sell us right so you know is it is it a little dark how skeptical i am maybe but you know i ain't gonna be duped you know is there, i don't want to be duped is, is there any thinker or philosopher that had a Significant influence on you while you went through that phase of uh, of reading uh, in, in in that. For line? me, it's all about. I I don't. I have no shame in it. For me, it's all about Jesus, and uh, that's. I met my wife in church, and I you know I've come back to that that way of faith. Um, it's been again, and never would you know. It, it I, that's that's the most important thing in my life. Was it was and, it always uh, what is a, was it always the case? Was it also the case? No, no. Your I would I always had a cross. I always had a cross on my neck, and I would have told you I believed, but nothing I did represented the man that I wore on my cross, mm-hmm. right? Nothing like I would. You believe in? Yes, I believe, but that was it. That was as far as I was willing to go because I I lived in so much darkness, right? That I wasn't willing to 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 bring the stuff in darkness into light. Right? I wasn't willing to work on myself. I wasn't really to get honest. And um, now it's everything in that book that, that, that's about him, you know, kind of that, that's my guide for living. And I, I fall short of it every single day I wake up. It, every wh- single day I fall short. Of what, that. Do you, what do you strive for every day? I, I want to I be, you know, I, I, I want to I live a life of maximal service. You know, I, I want to be a person that, you know, I had a conversation with my wife the other day. You know, I want to leave a legacy. I, I want people to remember the way I made them feel. And she's like, you already do that. I'm like, yes. <laughs> you know, and this is, this gets crazy. I'll tear up talking about this. Uh, are, you, are, you okay to push, are you okay to push up a little more into there? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm, I like crying. I'd say again, I would have been terrified of this however many years ago. To, I do this all the time. This isn't, I cry watching a sports movie. Like, this is who I am. I don't want to hide this. I want people to know it's okay. If you judge me and don't like me because of this, I don't want to be around you, right? That's like, if you, you answered my the podcast, thing, I told you, funny story. I'm actually snowboarding on a mountain right now. Is it all right? We do it from the car. If you said no, I would have been like, I'm not supposed to be on this podcast. <laughs> like, if he doesn't like this, then, you know, what? I'll be okay. You know, I don't know who you are, Sean. I, I'll probably never meet you. You're in Switzerland. Like, he'll get over it. But, you know, he said, yeah, that's awesome. Let's go. Yeah, but one of my questions is usually when we go into those realms is what do you want to be remembered for? You already answered that. Why do you want people to uh, remember how you made them feel? It, See, that, again, I don't want to start living for others because that's dangerous for me where I'm worried about how I make, I'm not worried about how I make them feel. My goal is, is to serve them. And, and because when I am most happy, when I feel like I am doing what I was put on this earth to do, it's when I'm serving, when I'm not in my hind brain, crazy thought, when I'm just 
100% present, focused, present, focused, right, is when I'm serving people, when I'm helping people. It is really hard to have a bad day when you're helping people. Like everyone that's complaining about everything going on in the world right now, you're not helping enough people because that's the answer, right? And I don't get into politics at all and I refuse to get into it because I don't want to be judged by some side. I don't want to be like, like the, me being skeptical. I'm skeptical of all sides. I'm not going to follow crazy theories and this and that. I don't have time for it. I'm too busy enjoying the people around me and serving the people in front of me. And that was a pivotal point too. I was part of a mastermind business group for two years. I paid way too much money for this thing, but I took away this. And it, it, like, if you're struggling, focus on serving the person in front of you. It was one sentence, serve the person in front of you. And that's when, I, when, when I'm struggling, I'm either in the past, you know, anxious or worried about things I did or, or how I was, you know, how people perceive me in the past, or I'm worried about the future. That doesn't happen when I'm helping people. All of that worry goes away because I know I'm doing what I'm designed to do. I know I'm doing, you know, what I'm supposed to be doing exactly. And that, that feeling only happens um, when I'm serving. From all the people that you kept around you when you were on your way to rebuilding yourself after those really hard times, what were the common traits that those people had that you can, you can say, okay, I'm going to align with those because? Uh, they're all flawed. <laughs> My friends are all like the guy sitting next to me right now. He's a, he's a sick puppy. Like I am, you know, we're all here. You want know, to see him? Yeah. He ain't, he ain't, he ain't normal, right? My friends are not normal. I, I am drawn to creativeness. I'm drawn to, to passionate people. I'm drawn to out of the box singers, um, honest to a fault people that, again, are the same way with their wives that they are with me, that are the same that, you know, I can cry in front of. My, I don't have, I, see, it doesn't feel, I do have a lot of relationships. Like, I don't know, I was about to say, like, I don't have a ton of relationships, but the ones I have, it's, I, I have, I'm blessed with the people in my life. And uh, we're just, we were like a core group, like my, I have all my training network and like those people, like the, the coaches that I talk to, but then I have like three best friends and we're all doing crazy stuff like this all the time. We're going out to, you know, we're going on a, on a boy snowboarding trip in a couple of weeks and, and we look at our lives and our, you know, our families. And, you know, you talked about, you know, how I got better and I saw guys that had done what I had done in terms of addiction and, you know, coming in with credit card debt and stole from people and jail time and all of this. And then I saw them like 20 years sober with like a wife and a dog and like a, you know, a nice car and, you know, a smile on his face. I'm like, how? Cause the way I was feeling when I was broken there, I was, there was, there was no smiling. And if it was, it was a fake smile. It was a mask. Right. So I gravitated to people that were happy and uh, that's what I just keep doing. But I've had to lose a lot of people on the way. And it's not, I don't feel bad about it. it. You know, maybe there's a little, like, a little guilt, you know, just, you know, trying to be humble. But there's not really any guilt for dropping people. Well, you know, be, I, don't, I don't turn my back. Yeah. I'll let you finish your thought. Go ahead. It, there's a difference between turning my back on somebody and just not, and, and understanding that they're not – Again, it sounds selfish, like they're not serving me anymore. It's not that they're not serving me. They're not on the same path that I am, right? You're not, you're not somebody I want to surround myself with, whether, whether they're, you know, drinking too much or, you know, just we're not, we're, we operate on different wavelengths. Mm -hmm. This relationship is not important enough to me to deter me from my vision and my dream. And, and, and the path that I'm on, I'm so confident in, in, in what I'm doing at this point that I'm not going to sacrifice it for any one relationship. But what that has done is made me value the relationships I do have and the people that are on their own journeys, right? We're not all on the same, but all my friends are on pretty remarkable, pretty miraculous journeys. 
and as long as they're that they're they're trying to get better and and they're trying to learn and be self-aware and you know strengthen their relationships um let's go like it's not like i'm you know you don't need to fill out an application just like you know call me we can talk like you call me anytime man you know yeah what what advice would you have for people who aren't happy right now ask for help find somebody happy and be like yo why are you happy you ask me why I'm happy, I could literally turn this camera around and you'll be looking at a mountain. Like, that's insane, right? You call, why are you happy? I don't know. I work really, really hard, right, to, to have this life that most people will never have. And I'm so grateful for it. And I'm never even grateful. Like, I still have bad days. Like, I'll have a bad day. I'm like, why am I having a bad day? My life's awesome, right? I got a nice truck. I got a house. I got a dog in a couple of weeks. I got awesome friends. I still have bad days. And what do I do? I call up one of my buddies and he goes, yo, you're an idiot. Like, <laughs> you're dumb. You're not having a bad day. This is not a ba bad day is when you were stealing from people to do drugs. Like, that's bad. Like, yeah, you know, you got a little boo-boo. Like, put a Band-Aid on it, you'll be okay. This is a, you know, this is a champagne problem. That's not a problem. I don't have any real problems today. And it's because of the people I surround myself with. Hmm. If, I, if I relied on my own thinking, my own flawed thinking, I could get in these rabbit holes of fear. Like, fear can... Fear can overcome me so quickly. And, I, and I, I speak personally saying me, but it's being a human. We, we are, and especially now with the amount of things, data, uh, information, salesmen, different gimmicks, the amount of stuff that we have to process. I, I don't know, again, there's a whole nother rabbit hole, but I don't know if as humans we are designed to, to, to handle all this. I don't know if we're supposed to be connected to everything. I don't know if it's supposed to be like that. You look back and it was more tribal, close knit family units. And that's what I have. Right. So like, you know, I've got a pretty decent mediocre following on Instagram and I'm, you know, I'm out here trying to help kids the best of my ability. And like some of y'all, your drill sucks. This is stupid. You're stealing. From, I'm like, you know, and part of me wants to go find him and kill him. Like that, I still have that in me too. Like, does this guy know I'm six foot seven covered in tattoo and have knives in my truck? Like a hunting knife, like not that I'm a savage, but like, does this guy know who I like? You have no idea. It's probably some like 13 year old little like twerp, like you know, somebody. But you know, if I let that fester, that could ruin my whole day, right there, right. And that's where I have to. I shut it off. I go on Instagram. I reply to positive comments. I delete bad ones. And I'm just gonna keep putting out good stuff. That what I think is good stuff. Maybe you don't think it's good stuff. I don't care anymore. If I have like a funny sentence or something I want to put on there, I'm putting it on there. It gets one like, whatever. I might delete it though, because you can't have one like. <laughs> uh, Bobby, I want to say thank you so much for coming on the podcast and and sharing all this. Uh, where can people find out more about your work? Uh, at Bobby White, B O B B Y W H Y T E. Uh, that's pretty much it. We have a podcast called The Effortless Athlete. Uh, it's not nearly as good as yours, but you know, if, you, if you're bored and uh, want to check that out, we, uh, we have conversations and we talk and we do this and uh, I love it. So we're going to keep going. Man, that's, that's awesome. Thanks again. I also want to say a big thank you to everybody who tuned into this episode. Make sure you follow Bobby on Instagram. Uh, the links are in the show notes as well as check out his podcast, Effortless Athlete. And to finish off, I just want to say thanks again to our sponsor for this episode, Strength Coach Network. You can go to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash upside to get 50% off your first month. And I'll see you in the next episode. Ciao.